Okay. That should be working. Yes. Okay, mm. so, oh, um, sorry, were you going to say something? I just said you? wonderful. <laughs> that <didn't work. laughs> That's it. Many thanks to all of you for, for joining us for this event. Um, which is organized by two Birkbeck Research Centers, uh, the CPRC and BRAC. We'll explain in a minute what they are all about. Uh, the event is entitled, What Can Poetry Do for Community? Uh, and Dr. Steve and Willie and myself are pleased to introduce to you five poets who will be discussing this question. Uh, I'm Nathalie Wurm, uh, a lecturer in 20th uh, and 21st century French literature, especially poetry at Birkbeck. I am also director of BRAC, which stands for Birkbeck Research in Aesthetics of Kinship and Community. It's a research center established 12 years ago. And the main aim of the center is to analyze, promote and commission artistic works of representation Presentation of the human bond in all its configurations across cultures and history. A big program, as you can imagine. Um, that's it for me. And now Steve will uh, introduce his research centre and himself. Thanks, Natalie. Yes, I'm uh, Steve Willey. I'm a lecturer in creative and critical writing here at Birkbeck and also a poet. Um, since 2015, I've been the director of Birkbeck's Contemporary Poetics Research Centre, the CPRC. The CPRC is a forum for the study and performance of contemporary poetries and research into their historical, political and theoretical contexts. It also serves as a focus and resource for the work of a group of PhD, student, PhD students located in the School of English Theatre and Creative Writing. And since its inception in 2002, the centre's work to develop existing links and new initiatives with the poetry community in London. And, and given that mission, I'm really pleased that this event is drawing into relation two of our current doctoral students, Kyo Chingoni and Matt Martin. And I'm also pleased to be welcoming back Fran Locke, who successfully completed her BA PhD at Birkbeck with us last year, her viva taking place in the very fraught circumstances of the first lockdown when we were still getting used to communicating um, in this mediated way. So Fran, it's great to have you back. And I'm also really excited to have the opportunity to involve Sarona Abuka and Jerome Gam um, to be able to facilitate connections that move us beyond this particular academic institution into a consideration of what poetry is and can be in other contexts. Um, just to finally say that the CPRC, CPRC has always been committed to fostering the whole range of poetic practice, including sound, visual and digital poetry with particular emphasis upon work that's in innovative in its materials and forms. And to this extent, but also in others, I think we find ourselves um, in relation, in sympathy of what Glissant terms the main themes of a poetics of relation, uh, which he lists as the, the dialectics between the oral and the written, uh, multilingualism, the balance between the present moment and duration, the questioning of literary genre. And, and he also talks about the power of the Baroque and uh, non-projectile imaginary uh, constructs. So I th hopefully um, th this will be an exciting event where we'll be able to hear a variety of um, short responses around this question of what poetry can do for community before we open out into a larger conversation between the participants. And then hopefully we'll be able to take some questions from you, our audience um, at the end. So we'll just ask you, as we get going um, to, to make sure your microphone is on, on mute throughout um, and save your questions um, until until the end, please, because um, that will make it easier for us to moderate the um, the event. Um, just a reminder that the event is being um, is being recorded. Um, our running order um, for this evening will be um, Fran, followed by Serona, Kayo, Matt, Jerome, and we'll introduce each speaker in full um, before they they give their five minute talk. Natalie, have I forgotten everything? Anything was that? Is that is that everything? No, no, no. That was very uh, uh, complete. No. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Shall I introduce Fran then? Uh, Fran Locke. Uh, she is the author of numerous 
chapbooks and seven poetry collections, most recently Contain Smiled Peril by Outspoken Press 2019, Hyena Jacko Dog, <laughs> a short collection of poems and essays is due from Pamanar Press. Her eighth full collection, High Enough, from Poetry Bus Press later in the year. She is an associate editor at Culture Matters, currently finalizing edits to The Cry of the Poor, an anthology of new writing about po poverty. Fran edits the Soul Food column for Communist Review and is a member of the new editorial advisory board for the Journal of British and Irish Innovative Poetry. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, it's really nice to be here talking to you about poetry, community and of course uh, Glisson. Um, I want to start actually by thinking about some of the ways in which the word community is currently being used out there in the world, such as it is, um, and a little of the unease that that provokes in me for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's become apparent to me that when I say community, I am not talking about the same thing as our local MP or my next door neighbour or the bloke down the pub, because when I talk about community, I'm referring to spontaneous and informal networks of horizontal solidarity predicated upon precisely the kinds of polyvocal and rhizomatic relationships Glisson is talking about in the Poetics of Relation. But when neoliberal culture is really great at doing this, is absorbing into itself um, the language of radicalism, draining it of meaning and repurposing it towards its own ends. Um, as a supporting and not unrelated instance, um, it did this with Audre Lorde's notion of self-care, which uh, Lorde describes in a burst of light as um, an act of political warfare. That's preserving the queer black self in the teeth of a world hostile to your very existence. Um, in the hands of neoliberal culture, this has become the nauseating self-coddling of white Instagram influencers. Um, and I think community has been hijacked in a very similar way to constitute a variety of ready-made categories of belonging, which implicitly exclude anyone not comfortably cradled within their prescriptive limits. Um, here on the Kent coast, where I live now, with the ever vomit-inducing border patrol force as a continuous blot on the landscape, um, community is often aligned to this embattled national or local identity, sort of beset by obtruding or invading others. Um, I've also become very aware in recent years that the insert name here, community rhetoric, has become a really useful tool in the hands of neoliberalism for dividing broader networks of solidarity into splinter cells of competing sectional interests. Um, as an example, uh, we might think about the way political centrists use the rhetorical frameworks of identity politics to take down left-leaning opponents. So, I mean, specifically how Clinton Biden represented the Sanders campaign for democratic leadership in the US as this anachronistic class war agenda that deflected attention from white racism, willfully ignoring the obvious fact that class inequality is an inherent and structural feature of racism and that racism is an inherent and structural feature of class inequality. So I've also been wondering about what the costs are of being an identifiable community um, in that particular sectional way and to what extent we're still able to stake radical political claims on rendering those identities visible. Um, we can see this in the very targeted legislation dealing with the administration of traveller populations within Ireland and the UK. It's very recent in the UK indeed. Um, and community here has become a kind of double-edged sword. So it's the method by which we may articulate for recognition and for rights, but um, it also contributes to our further enmeshment in the apparatus of the state. So our public perception, as well as this subaltern other, and our vulnerability to various kinds of harassment and violence from the wider populace. And this is where I find myself coming back to Glisson, who's demand for the right to opacity calls into question the implied ethical imperative contained within the claims of identity politics to visibility as any kind of exemplary political platform 
So I think Glissant's all about the way in which visibility is coerced and contoured by both political discourse and the apparatus of state control. And I have this gorgeous quote, which I'm just going to read because I think it's fucking fantastic. So it says, we agree not merely to the right to difference, but carrying this further, agree also to the right to opacity that is not enclosure within an impenetrable ortiki, but subsistence within an irreducible singularity. Opacities can coexist and converge weaving fabrics. To understand these truly, one must focus on the texture of the weave and not on the nature of its components. So this notion of opacity, it's obviously greatly influenced my practice as a writer, but more importantly, I think it's my experience and my attitude um, as an editor and my self-appointed mission at <laughs> Culture Matters for the last, the last couple, 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 of, couple years of years and going, and going forward. forward has been to use the anthology format as um, a practical mechanism for fostering solidarity um, and for enacting the kinds of mutually responsible reciprocity and community that the books dare to imagine. So we've done two now, um, one of which collected uh, contemporary women's poetry with a particular emphasis on the intersections of gender identity with the notion of work or labour. And we have one due out later this year, collecting various genres of writing, exploring the notion of uh, poverty. Um, so in this role, we consider ourselves facilitators of both testimony and exploration. And the anthology offers a method by which these relationships and intersections between identities and experience might be apprehended and investigated. So having fostered those networks, what we're then trying to do is, is carry that forward through our activism and through just extending our care in small practical ways to, to our contributors. As community, um, I think, is never made. It, it's only enacted. It's something you do. And it's not just about the poetry as it appears on the page. It is making something with poetry as, as a group and, and as a community. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Fran. Uh, that's, that was a great and so many things um, to pick up on. And for those of you who joined um, either at the beginning or, 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 or partway through, the, the plan is to try to save our discussion until we've heard each of the five minute talks. So if you do have a question, please try to um, hold hold on to it. So um, I'm going to um, introduce um, Sirona Abuka now. Sirona is a poet and artist. Her mixed media essay, Suture Fragmentations, A Note on Return, is published with KOHL, Cole, a journal for body and gender research. And her poems are featured in Berfois, Map Magazine, and the 87 Press Digital Poetics series. She is currently writing her debut collection, Why So Few Women on the Street at Night, to be released by the 87 Press in 2021. A queer fem feminology of collective Palestinian futurisms and memory building, layering visual cultures, essays and poems to approach territories as different as Turtle Island, Broccoli and Palestine. She is based in London. Um, Serona, I'm going to mute myself. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone um, for being here and thank you for this invitation. I'm, it's very much needed. <laughs> I think um, this is definitely something I've missed. I think just being able to access these spaces in person. Um, so it feels very refreshing. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of what I've been thinking about um, emerges from Glissant's writing as the chaotically onward and what he says is the needing words to publish itself and to continue. And I think that's where I'm finding a lot of my practice and my research kind of um, emerging from. So since the unity intifada erupted in May in Palestine and seeing those military forces pushing Palestinians out of their homes and me knowing those streets and knowing those neighborhoods and knowing that I'm not legally allowed inside of that neighborhood, inside of that city of Jerusalem, because of my ID. I wrote poems because I did not know where else to turn to or who else to turn to. Um, it is a chaotic onward in many senses. Um, cultural production and especially poetry, I find is a place to turn to, towards, to create other directions. And Palestinian cultural production is a rich and explicitly political practice 
It emerges from a context of Palestinians facing physical, emotional, and cultural erasure from the land of historic Palestine and the fragments and slivers upon which we are now permitted upon. What does community look like under erasure? And that's something I'd hopefully like to explore with everyone today and onwards. Um, and these cultural practices range from texts, films, poster making, installations, um, and the way in which the, these forms kind of take place and are shaped are out of the temporality of inhabiting a space that is under military and occupation and settler colonial um, erasure. So for example, posters are easy to see on the street, on the walls in public when you're running from soldiers, whereas films require time and stillness. Perhaps that's not afforded to those on the front lines. Poetry is mobile. Poems are written in prisons and smuggled out to, to find themselves on the lips of those protesting in the streets, such as Nuh Ibrahim from the 1936 Palestinian revolt against British colonial rule. Mahmoud Darwish's identity card poem as well um, placed him under house arrest when it became a, um, when it became a, a form of a protest song. What does creating poetry then look like when the act of naming yourself is criminalized. And what happens then when the name itself, Palestine or many others, become a commodification for capitalists investments, such as the former Palestinian prime minister who launched a capitalist investment forum in Ramallah and declared it as Palestine is throwing a party and the whole world is invited. Um, I would like to name or to read a brief passage from a manuscript of mine of the one that um, Stephen named, um, titled Why So Few Women on the Street at Night, um, and then just end with a few questions. Um, this is from Celluloid. Um, it was published in Map Magazine. Um, what is the distinction between archiving and surveillance? The tear gas canister, the triple chaser, is the most fatal because it breaks itself apart into three pieces to cover more ground and bodies on its impact. The separating canister. According to the Defense Technologies website function, find a dealer. I can purchase tear gas from one of their suppliers within 40 miles of the city I used to live in. I can also experience it in the parts of Palestine I'm legally only allowed to access in accordance with the identity card issued to me. Year 1999, West Bank permitted. Jerusalem, 48 historical borders, the Gaza Strip are non permitted. See what we carry. The paper, ink, heaviness, tongue, cracked bones are not just a bodily experience, they are policy. The red eyes, stinging, spluttering, inhale if you can. Rip the maps off our necks and carve into our chests what you think is the most revolting thing about us. I don't want just a stamp in my documents, passport, ID card, denying, entry, exit, curfew, water, family, friends, home. I want to feel the weight of your hatred on me so I can measure the strength by which I will need to muster to hit you back and you will feel it in every way towering over you, our voices filling the skies, our bodies shaking the streets, our hands on your faces, documents, passports, ID cards, ID cards, laws, checkpoints, surveillance, towers, guns, ripping everything you have created and making space making room for the world we deserve to live in. Glissant wrote that the shape of the Caribbean embodies the poetics of relation. I want to ask what other ways can our ever-changing geographies embody these poetics? The language that we come to grips with ourselves and others is something I focus on throughout my work. And this is clearly a question and negotiation that countless others consider. I would like to ask for consideration when we are thinking about language in creating, constituting, affirming community, experimentations and oral testimony and collective memory. As Fran mentioned, what is the role of opacity in this? What does opacity under settler colonial erasure subvert? And can it help us write in a language that does not exile us as Adonis wrote as the language that he writes in? Um, so thank you again, and I'm looking forward to what everyone else has to say. Thank you so much, Serona. That was really interesting and provocative and lots of threads that I can already think of to, to Fran's um, talk as well. So I'm going to quickly stop spotlighting you and then um, move to introduce um, Kayo Chingonyi. Kayo was born in Zambia in 1987 and moved to the UK at the age of six, 
In 2012, he was award, awarded a Jeffrey uh, Diemer Prize and was associate poet at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in 2015. His first full length collection, Kum Ukanda, won the Dylan Thomas Prize and the Somerset Morgan Award. Kaya was Burgess Fellow at the Centre for New Writing, University of Manchester, before joining Durham University as an assistant professor of creative writing. He is a writer and presenter for the music and culture podcast Decode on Spotify, and his most recent collection, A Blood Condition, just out with Chateau and Windus, is shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Collection. He is working towards a practice-based PhD on poetry and digital sampling here at Birkbeck. Kaya, I'm going to um, put myself on mute, pass over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it's delightful to be in company with these poets and thinkers this evening, uh, both uh, in this immediate present and also through um, scholarship and quotation and illusion as well. Um, I'm feeling Glissant's presence in a really wonderful way uh, for a Monday evening. Uh, I wrote down what I wanted to say almost word for word because I have a tendency to vary from the script. So I'm going to read it. Um, it's not my usual way, but um, I wanted to make sure that I kept within the time. Uh, and by saying that to you, I've already gone outside of it. So I'll have to truncate some portions. Uh, in my preparation for this talk, um, I started thinking about the importance of community to my poetic praxis through the lens of two sites of poetic community, uh, the poetry workshop and the open mic. When I was 17, I joined a workshop group run in partnership by Spread the Word and Apples and Snakes, um, both kind of writer development agencies in London. The purpose of the fortnightly workshops was to for foment poetic expression encourage kinship between writers. And there was a sense in these sessions as well of an open syllabus. Um, it was inclusive, not just of poetic craft, but also certain things that we might need beyond versification to function in the world, I suppose. Um, and in particular, um, the sense of community that it, that it led to was a, a way of arming me to flourish in a world that didn't want me to flourish as a young black man. Um, so community at that point was was codified through commitment to an indivisibility from a particular physical community. Um, and I suppose that stood in contrast to the machinations of the literary establishment as I knew it then because there was a real rarefied sensation when you entered those spaces. Um, at this early stage of my writing life, I met the editor of a venerated poetry magazine who made it clear to me without having seen my work that mine was not the kind of work they published in the pages of their magazine. I didn't send any poems to that magazine for over 10 years until a guest editor for that magazine asked me to send them. So it really pushed me out um, of that particular community um, and Reinscribed the importance of the community to which I belonged, which was a live community uh, in, in poetry readings. Um, and that was the one I was allowed to step into. And so that performance arena was the kind of publication to which I aspired. Um, my work was to bring together uh, a set of poems that I might perform at an open mic night with a view to being booked from an open mic night for a more established event somewhere else as a kind of feature artist. Um, and there's a sense of connection there, I suppose, to stand up comedy and that ecosystem as well, and that sense of community. And that ecosystem persists. I mean, it's been curtailed by the current situation. Um, but stand up and the kind of poetry scene that I was part of, they're frequent kind of interlocutors in the in the popular imagination. Um, and it's that site specific form of poetic making and communal poetic making. That's a really important through line uh, in my work to this day, that sense of a feedback loop between audience, poet and poem that arises from the experience of the poem happening in the same moment and in the same place. Um, and I suppose the relationships I fostered in that time remain the foundational relationships that kind of guide my writing to this day. Um, 
I can illustrate that in terms of an anecdote that arises from that workshop I was going to when I was 17. In that workshop was another poet who was born on the same day as me, but a year later, um, a poet who's since become one of my best friends and someone with whom I share a kind of an affinity with the history of black British poetry. And we're writing into the same tradition and there's this sense of us being contemporaries in life as well as in poetic practice. So before I finish with a quotation from, from, from that friend, um, I want to just mention um, a few of the people from whom we inherited uh, our tradition, the communities that came before us, like the Afro Style School, Urban Poets Society, Malaika's Poetry Kitchen, Manifest, Apricot Jam, Common Word, the George Padmore Institute, and various flashpoints um, that served as um, places of crossing over, I suppose, uh, for culture um, outside of the structures of the establishment. Um, and so that particular poet with whom I shared workshop space when I was 17 and they were 16 was Jay Bernard um, and published on the same um, stable as they are, which feels opposite somehow. Um, but Jay says this, which I'm going to attempt to share with you through the magic of uh, screens. Can you see this at all? No, maybe not. I'll read it to you. Um, oh, here we go. Magical. Little kids running around in the middle of the hall and there's the cake and the sound system and all the adults just sitting there getting drunker and drunker. The anticipation of the food, which is really why everyone's there. It's just like there's a set of practices that can't ever be replaced, that are incredibly simple, incredibly elemental in some ways and nourishing in just the simplest possible way. Nothing special is going on. It's just people in a room, but there's a certain set of understandings and practices, and it's almost a reflective experience. Uh, that will always, it's important to me that my work written or in performance is for the crowd, for that crowd. That will always be really valuable to me. And I think that that ultimately is where I situate myself and my writing. When I think about myself as a writer, ultimately, I'm in the corner of such a room watching blackness play out. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kaya. That was wonderful. And um, we have just had someone um, join us. So just to say we'll be having a, a conversation after Matt Martin and J Jerome's talk, and then there'll be space for um, more questions at the end. But thank you so much for that contribution, Kaya. That was brilliant. Matt Martin is a is the Stuart Hall Researcher Scholar at Birkbeck, where he's been also teaching English and creative writing while completing a PhD on the use of dialect and nation language by experimental poets like Kamal Brathwaite and Bill Griffiths. His own poetry collections include Full Spectrum Apotheosis, published by Contraband Books, and The Dotted Line, published by Gang Press in 2019. His visual poems have appeared in exhibitions at the South Bank Centre and the Poetry Society. He maintains the innovative poetry readings in London, which is a listing of poetry activities in the capital that can be found on the CPRC uh, webpage. Um, Matt, I'm going to um, mute myself, pass over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to um, Natalie and all, all the presenters and everyone for being here as well. Of course, it's been great so far. Um, I've, I've been thinking a bit about this question of um, linguistics and how um, that might operate in practice in response to uh, Edouard Glissant's ideas, uh, both in everyday speech and uh, within poetry. So hopefully this will speak a little bit to what uh, the question Sarone was right, raising about how the opacity of language might uh, intervene in practice, uh, especially within the kind of rhizomatic communities that Fran was uh, discussing. So one of Glisson's key ideas is that one should write, he says, in the presence of all the world's languages. And um, of course, that, that doesn't have to mean using more than one language, uh, though that would be one approach, uh, but rather writing in awareness of, he says, uh, relations between today's languages on the surface of the earth. Uh, 
relations of domination, connivance, absorption, oppression, erosion, tangency, etc., as the fact of an immense drama, an immense tragedy from which my own language cannot be exempt and safe. So these power dynamics between and within languages have a strong bearing on my research about how avant-garde poets can use subaltern forms of speech, varieties often thought of as dialects, uh, though to avoid that word's pejorative connotations, I've tended to use the term nation language, which the Barbadian poet Camo Brathwaite proposes for the diverse patois and creoles spoken in the Caribbean. Uh, though he also shows willingness for the label to apply further afield as well. It's important to note that nation language is in many ways opposed to the concept of a national language. So we're talking here about speech rooted in community, varying in degree between groups and individuals, even between different occasions in the speech of one person. Uh, nation language therefore epitomises Glisson's injunction against writing monolinguistically since they're in continual dialogue with official standard languages, as well as nation languages of other communities and tongues that historically influenced these ways of speaking. So in the case of the Caribbean, that would include languages spoken by African ancestors of today's African Caribbean population. So I've th been thinking about how Caribbean concepts from thinkers like Glisson and Brathwaite could apply to communities in the UK with a focus on the northeast of England and the work there of the poet Bill Griffiths. He was originally from the London area, but in 1990 moved to Seaham, a mining and fishing town on the coast of County Durham, where he got heavily involved in local culture, activism and dialect research. In 1998, he co-founded the Durham and Tyneside Dialect Group uh, to catalogue and promote the vocabulary of the region's speech with the major output being different editions of a dictionary of Northeast dialect. And these dictionaries were sourced not only from historical texts, but through soliciting input from dialect speakers by way of distributing questionnaires around the uh, area and later by setting up a website where anyone with internet access could submit terminology. Uh, the question of authorship itself was therefore partly devolved to this wider community. Initially in the CM and, uh, you know, general northeast area, but then via the internet to a potentially global network of dialect knowledge. Uh, so owing to a combination of uh, an education system which devalued dialect, the influence of national and international media and the winding down of local mining and fishing industries where a lot of that lexicon originated, uh, northeast dialect was becoming sparser in the 1990s, arguably it still is despite their efforts. Uh, Griffiths was interested in counteracting that tendency through various strategies, which could involve encouraging the invention of new dialect expressions or finding creative new uses for existing terms. And there's a long tradition of this in the Northeast. Uh, the words in by and out by, for example, originally indicated inside and outside, uh, but during the 19th century, they were transferred into pitmatic. Uh, the specialist tongue of the Northeast's coal miners to indicate movement towards and away from the work face of a pit. So noting a tendency towards compound words in Northeast speech, uh, including modern examples like uh, star heed for a Phillips screw and joined up thinking for adult intelligence on the model of you know, joined up writing, Griffiths proposes creating new compound dialect terms. So he suggests an ingle box for a cigarette lighter, ingle means a flame, or shopping garth for a shopping mall. Garth means like a yard or sometimes a garden. Uh, these historic and possible future coinages are kind of acts of micro scale poesis in their own right and represent possibilities for kind of reciprocal exchange between conversational usage and poetry. The poems are sometimes deploying words from within the community and sometimes inventing new terms that the community might take up. But you know, what could a community gain from this poetic facility? As in the historical pitmatic of the Northeast coal miners, there's the workplace benefit of having precise, concise names for equipment or geological features that might not exist in standard English. Although without the workplaces themselves still in operation, that advantage might be marginal. And there could also be an aesthetic and cognitive advantage in using words that sound more like the things they mean. So as the Northeastern poet um, Katrina Porches, an occasional 
collaborator of Griffiths has noted, uh, between a hobbly and a gurly sea, it is not difficult to tell which is a light surface roll, which is hobbly, and which is deeper, more powerful swell, gurly. But the key gain is political. When a speech for registers the linguistic history of a community and is celebrated in the arts as well as being used for everyday communication, uh, this could strengthen a community's sense of identity and their right to self-determination. Uh, given the enormous range of transcultural influences and etymologies feeding into any nation language, this should be possible while remaining open and welcoming to other communities and other people. Uh, in this regard, poetry and nation language or dialect could help to bring about uh, Glisson's vision of a world where community transcends the concept of the nation state, becoming more local but also more porous. Uh, he says that uh, Europe is archipelagizing. Linguistic regions, cultural regions beyond the boundaries of nationhood are islands, but open islands, this being their main condition for survival. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Matt. That was uh, perfect and um, also very um, provocative. Lots of threads that I want to pick up on in our, in our conversation later. So I'm going to hand over to Natalie for our, for our final introduction and final speaker. Right. Um, so it's, um, it's an honour to introduce Jérôme Gam. Thank you very, very much, Jérôme, for accepting my invitation. Uh, Jérôme is a French poet and writer, author of 10 collections of poems, a novel, several CDs of sound poetry, a DVD of video poems, and six volumes of essays. His poetry is also shown in exhibitions as visual textual installations, exploring the shapes and flows of contemporary experience via the, those of discourses, narratives and images. Jérôme often collaborates with musicians, stage directors and visual artists for collective performances and regularly gives public readings of his work in Europe, North Africa, Asia and the Americas. Appearing in numerous journals, his texts have been translated into English, Chinese, Italian, Japanese, Spanish and Dutch. OVNI, the play he co-wrote, premiered at the Avignon Festival in July 2018 and in 2020, LA, a stage production of Flip Book, his collection of poems, opened at the Mecca Bordeaux Festi Festival. Flip Book and Other Poems a collection of his poems translated into English is forthcoming from Bach Press, London. He lives in Paris and teaches philosophy at the Haute École des Arts du Rhin and having held research and faculty positions at UCL, the American University of Paris and Columbia University. Over to you, Jérôme. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you very much, Steve, for uh, for gathering us today and uh, and inviting me. I would like to thank my colleagues whose uh, whose uh, words were extremely inspiring and interesting. What can poetry do for community? Perform its artificiality, activate its materiality, showcase its malentendu, never shy away from its corporeity and its violence and its intensity, and ultimately its beauty and the way in which it can carry us forward. What I mean to say with those rather heavy uh, introducing words, please uh, excuse me, is that the link between poetry and community is uh, extremely rich, and I was about to say simultaneously paradoxical and structural. I would like to mention briefly this notion of community in the terms that Gilles Deleuze uses, I think it's in um, A Thousand Trail in Capitalism and Schizophrenia, as a swarm, an essence, a swarm, um, a swarm would be this paradoxical community. A swarm would be a, an ensemble of bees or sparrows that simultaneously can coalesce into a shape and the second afterwards disappear. And I use this, this, this uh, link, this concept by Deleuze because we can see from his definition that it's not going to be too pragmatic to organize a fortiori in an age of globalization and across the planet. Um, communities don't grow on trees. They're not, um, they're not all done, they're man-made. And what is made can be uh, undone. Uh, and here I think it's quite important to remind ourselves of what Rancière says in The Sharing of the Sensible, uh, 
that the relationship between the word and the police, that is to say between possibly poetry and community, is one that is both structural and uh, violent. Um, a community is uh, built through dissensus, through disagreements, and so we tend to see it as something where agreement has taken place, and to some extent it has, but it always has to the extent uh, that it's hiding a series of structural dissensus. And it seems to me that poetry has to uh, simultaneously, I won't use the word celebrate because it's a difficult word for me, it has to enjoy those, those consensus, but always show those dissensus, the fight, the fight that politics systematically is, and politics standing here for the archetype of the community and vice versa, uh, the political fight that is always hidden, naturalized underneath this notion of community, um, that is also the place uh, said community uh, for the sharing of the sensible, which is a bit of a, another oxymoron. The sharing of the sensible is always predicated on it being decentral, on it being um, a division and a fight. What can poetry do in all of this? Um, well, it can do what Gilles is telling us when he talks about language and uh, capitalism and schizophrenia. Let me quote it, translated live into English. I quote, um, shape sentences that are grammatically correct is for the normal individual. Uh, the first thing that she has to do in order to submit to social laws, no one is supposed to ignore the correct grammaticality. Those who ignore it uh, will be treated in institutions. The unity of a language is first and foremost political. If we follow this definition, this political definition of a community, well then, Poetry is here to do a politics of dissensus, of dissent, um, and of awakening of the violence that is hidden underneath um, the apparent naturality of community. Poetry in this sense, in my work, those last few uh, books I was about to say, has been to deal with the very uh, thin line between transitive and intransitive. I don't know whether this is exactly the same in English, but transitive and intransitive means in French that um, that there's going to be a different relationship to the object that the subject is supposed to pursue. In other words, that the clarity of the sense of self that the subject will have will be more or less clear. Poetry is here to intransitivize what is transitive and vice versa. So as to organize what would be a bit of an oxymoron that I used in a, one of my essay um, and, and, and books of critical essay would be a, a porous community. A porous community that would be a bit like the uh, the swarm that uh, that Lewis talks about, uh, a common idiosyncrasy, one that can paradoxically resist the systematic inclusion, all the while permitting something that will be an encounter, and muster strength to undo the violence, systemic violence that exists in all gatherings, uh, social gatherings of a, of a large scale, always remain a practice, all the while allowing for um, gatherings between people to take place. This dissensus, this essential community to speak like Rancière, is this oxymoron that uh, that poetry has to take on. In my work in the last few years, it has taken a, a series of um, a series of, uh, of of manners of ways. First is to fight against this um, this awkward uh, vision that we're told uh, that we've entered since the last thirty years, which is called the visual turn. The visual turn is something that has just happened after the textual turn or the linguistic turn, as if we were moving from one big paradigm to another in hermetic, sealed, organized, um, industrial, critical discourses um, that would have given this verbose logoria of semiotic techno-capitalism that we're very much inside. We're actually talking through one of them. It's simultaneously extremely useful and extremely dangerous as to the, uh, the capacities that language has to cut through um, the efficiency of communities, particularly when they are equipped technologically. The second, and I'm very much aware that I'm saying this speaking in English to English speaking colleagues and friends, is the globish English that has become the default position, the lingua franca of the current um, capitalist globalization in which we're emerged. The third one would be the moral puritanism that is always waiting um, uh, in hiding each time a uh, progressist movement is pushed forward through notably the, the forces of, um, of uh, verbalization and uh, literary uh, and critical capacities. All of these uh, problems, all of these tensions that make for this oxymoronic community 
uh, that poetry can equip and can uh, sail through are very difficult for us to realize and to face. And nonetheless, I think that it's very much um, our task, particularly as we wonder what a community could be. I was quite sensitive to the fact that in your title, I quote, what can poetry do for a community? You didn't say communities, you didn't say the community. In other words, you escaped what is currently marring the French political debate from which I speak to you between universalism and, um, and singularities. Um, and I think that's quite interesting that you phrase it like this, um, to keep it at this level as something we have to face head on uh, and to organize what I would call a pragmatics of uh, political poetry or poetic politics. Someone is always um, reshaping, rewiring the performativity that poetry can be inside politics for politics to be something else and just the unfolding of a series of uh, transcendental concepts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jérôme, um, and thank you to all of you. Um, that was really great, um, very thought-provoking, and I think we'll, I, I too can see quite a few links. I mean, uh, uh, this um, Jérôme and uh, Sarona have um, clearly uh, a, di a sort of unspoken dialogue going about the politics uh, and the violence of, of the concept of community. I don't know if you would like to. Um, did you did you uh, see a resonance, uh, Sarona and Jérôme, between your your talks? I would say I was I was very impressed by uh, by Sarona's uh, talk um, and how she read what she did. Uh, and I think, yes, yes, I felt personally very inspired by what she had to say. Uh, she reminded me that uh, that poetry is an act, is an agency, and that words are um, very uh, strong to make sense of where we are and to try and, and change it. So, yes, I was very inspired by what she had to say. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, and thank you to every everyone on this uh, do we call this a panel? Everyone who's spoken. Um, <laughs> everyone here. Everyone here. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's just given so much to think about. And definitely, I think, um, between Jerome's um, idea around, I think, first off, stating it as it, it doesn't shy, poetry doesn't shy away from its corporeality or its violence and its beauty. Um, and I really love... Um, the idea of the swarm that was brought about. There's this, um, it reminds me of this um, poem by Taufik uh, Ziada, who is a Palestinian communist who wrote, um, who wrote, who has this really famous line that said, um, in your eyes, we will remain, we, we are a sandstorm. And that's what kind of came to mind speaking about Palestinians to settler colonial structure. And that's kind of what it reminded me of, the ways in which, how do we create a swarm against the structures that are killing us? Um, what does swarm look like? What are the aesthetics of, of, of swarming per se, whether in language or through the act of like bodily swarming? Um, and this idea of poetry of, as deconsensus, breaking apart that this kind of state sanctioned unity um, I think speaking from my current kind of positionality, this idea of, um, I guess, the inverse of deconsensus, which is fragmentation, um, or what Fran, Fran uh, eloquently really put, is the splintering self of community interest. I think how do we work with, as communities who've been fragmented and splintered, um, within deconsensus and opacity? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just some thoughts. I think these are crucial thoughts and the paradox would, would be to say how we can um, create a community. Uh, we just define community as um, we who are here, right here, right now, and whomever is here now. How can we muster this? How can we create those communities with strategies, all the while resisting, resisting the hardening of said communities into um, all sorts of devices that are going to prevent the energy that it has to unfold? and to have some efficiency. 
This is what I tried to, me to mean by transitive and intransitive, to have an object and to resist this position of subject facing an object. I wonder if I can come in very, very, very briefly there and, and try to, you know, in, in, in many ways, this idea of, of violence permeated all the talks, didn't it? I mean, from Kayo's, which where he said he wanted to try to flourish in a world that didn't want him to flourish, mm -hmm. um, to, to Fran's talk where she was talking about the kind of double-edged sword of, of community, the ways in which um, neoliberal culture tries to absorb or manages in fact to absorb the language of radicalism to Matt's talk where he was you know talking about the, the the reality of writing in the presence of all the world's languages means engaging with power dynamics which are hostile to 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 the language that um, might be your own or the language you need and want to speak in um and of course, Sirona and, 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 and Jerome, we, you, you've talked a bit just now about the way in which a confrontation um, with violence or ideas of violence might be. And this is my question. This is the question. I wonder whether the confrontation with violence or acknowledgement of violence is, is a precondition um, for an engagement with that term community. Uh, and, I, and I wondered whether, whether I can be as bold as saying it has to be a a precondition for to be to be a, a poet interested in engage with that term community does there from you know almost from the beginning need to be some way of navigating um violence to be able to kind of um for that term to be to be politically useful or even creatively useful and i guess i, I would lo love to hear some responses to that if there are any and i guess my, my follow-up question or, or, or query is, is then about strategies and so many of you came up with so many different strategies for negotiating violence I mean and I, and I wonder whether there's a deeper conversation to have to, to be had there between Fran's um, identification of, of the anthology form as a way of of, of, of moving forward to, to Jerome's three very clear points um, fighting against the visual turn fighting against global English thank you by the way, Jerome, for speaking in English and tonight, um, and 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 the moral puritism he he, he identified. Um, but, you know, but Kayo also talked about uh, the importance of site uh, specificity and trying to find that feedback loop between poet, audience, and poem. So, yeah, there's there's two parts. The, the question about violence, um, and whether that's a precondition for engaging with community, and then I have this other kind of query about um, strategies. I'm going to stop there. I wonder if anyone can respond from the panel to that. Um. Well, I, I think that when you talk about when you talk about uh, the violence, it seems to me that that as we even if we're in one's chamber room writing poetry, somewhat disconnected in Virginia Woolf's manner from the rest of the world, we're going to end up singularizing a common tool. We're going to write in a language that we didn't create, that we don't own, and yet we're going to, one way or another, imprint something in it that wouldn't be there had it been for us. So there's going to be the sheer fact that singularizing a common tool is going to have some level, perhaps not of violence, but of, of uh, brutal input of appropriation. Uh, that is going to be obviously if it's only this then it won't go very far will it we're going to have to listen to the other we've talked about Vison. we could talk about from levinas to uh, judith butler we're going to have to have an ethicality in it but this ethicality is going to be working hand in hand with not on appropriation not a way of standing there as if we own the place but some way of getting in it which leads me to this notion we this word we perhaps this is a synonym of the topic we're talking about today community what is a we? How does it show up? Uh, who, who is who is we? Um, how do we know that this we is constituted? Um, too much we and it becomes cement. Too little of it and it's a, a, an ethereal notion that has no agency, neither aesthetic nor historical. So it's a bit of a, of a really tricky dilemma, this we. Uh, this is what I, I meant by saying that why don't we spend our time trying to arrange in the sense of agencer in the delusion sense, Wees, as it were, wees that are porous, uh, that are uh, that are uh, simultaneously very strong and very very ductile and flexible, so that we can never become the first victim of the wees we spend our time preaching to or about. 
Thank you, Jerome. I wonder, can, can I can I can I ask you, 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 you Fran, and and, and Kaio, just to maybe talk a little bit more about how you negotiate the we in your work, and 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 and, and Fran, could you say a little bit more about the the anthology form, and uh, you know, because it, it, it strikes me that anthologies are kind of um, could be particularly vulnerable to 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 being um, to being on the wrong side of visibility. You know, it has to. You have to tread that line so carefully when when presenting an anthology. So, yeah, and I'm not sure that we we get it right necessarily, but we're making an attempt, and it's very much. I feel um, it's a sort of process that we're involved in with our contributors in figuring out how we do that and how we negotiate that violence and how we hold people um, from all different kinds of backgrounds with all different experiences. Um, many of us with um, experiences of, um, as Serona was talking about, community in erasure and that kind of idea of, you know, of, of a scattering and being fragmented and, and being scattered and then having to kind of either you're using that tactically or you, you learn to use that tactically. I won't say as a positive because I don't think the experience of having your communities um, torn up and destroyed is, is ever positive. <laughs> But you learn to use that against the system that that is oppressing you in some way, or you find a way of coalescing and creating new offshoots and new communities. So we're just, I think the anthology for, for us, which is maybe different than some of the other kind of anthology projects out there, is that we're really trying to find um, a way of holding all these different affinities together and to create a kind of, of, of a commons, I guess. Um, I think it's a really good question and I think the idea of violence strikes me as well and it seems like the to follow on from what you were saying Fran there's something that is almost like a there's a collective statement you can make in an anthology which is a strength I think in in relation to certain kinds of uh, state force and I guess one of the things I've been thinking about in relation to community and poetry is that my entry into the UK was marked by certain kinds of racialized violence. I arrived in the UK in 1993 um, about 10 days after Stephen Lawrence was murdered and then there was Roland Adams as well and um, I guess also a big part of my childhood was interacting with with the bombing of Iceland in Brixton and the Admiral Duncan pub and um, also Brick Lane. Um, so there's a sense in which um, the threat of violence has been like a kind of constant looming presence. And so there's this um, there's this kind of necessity of writing about and through that but then there's also the violence of certain kinds of poetic community refusing that kind of representation uh, and feeling that it is distasteful or problematic to write about race so di directly. Um, and I speak here to Serona's point about forms of state erasure. I feel like, um, yeah, certain, certain aspects of literary culture that I was first um exposed to were very clear in their terms that in order to be part of them i had to subdue those kind of political engagements so i think yes participating in certain kinds of poetic community is predicated on um the acceptance that um our flourishing is not tolerated um by yeah, certain certain kinds of 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 state sanctioned or emboldened violence that have existed for a long time um, and persist as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like at certain moments in in community with poets and audiences, it's been possible to move outside of those pressures momentarily and thereby access some kind of hope and. Um, yeah, I suppose the fuel for further action 
Thank, thank you, Kyo. I'm I'm wondering, um, Natalie, whether now would be a good a good opportunity um, to to invite um, further questions um, from from our audience, if there are any. I saw in the chat. Oh, Jerome would like Jerome. I was I was wondering. I was very interested in what Fran was saying about about uh, about an anthology. Um, an anthology is not a playlist. Uh, it's an editorial gesture that is way stronger than this one. Uh, we are again not to sound like the uh, paranoiac, but we're in, we're in an epoch with this uh, notion of a uh, playlisting oneself or the other or everything is very much occulting uh, the editorial gesture that can be a counter shot to this. Uh, and she also, you did also mention, Fran, uh, commons and affinities. Commons is difficult to translate into French, and I think it's quite uh, interesting, a symptom. Commons uh, is not a community. Um, Les communs is being used now because it's being translated from the English. Uh, but I think it's quite interesting. It's, it's, it's not the same thing, is it, as a community, or as community is something um, uh, different. And I find this quite interesting in um, an editor editorial platform. In a, in a, what is the what is the publishing list of an editor or of a publisher if it's not a community? A community that's being built, a community of readership that are possible, of relationships that are going to be built, uh, but without pre-existing as a community. It's, it's the it's the opposite of a church. Uh, you will have you might have followers without a doxa, without priests. Um, and in this sense, it's a very interesting way of secular, isn't it? Modern of producing comments. Just wanted to. Come back. Yeah, I was just sort of I like the idea of commons as opposed to a community because I always feel that a community has this um, kind of implicit limit set on it. There are those contained within, there are those contained without, whereas I think the commons is much more plural. I like to think of a commons as a piece of common land. It's a place rather than this sort of containing building. It's it's the earth underneath us. Um, and coming from um, a kind of traveler background, that's something that's, you know, it's, it's incredibly important to me that you, you don't own this space and I don't feel proprietorial about my editorship and, and who I'm including and who I'm not including. It's very much um, an evolving conversation that we have all kinds of, um, of guest editors coming in as well. Um, and people, you know, the contributors kind of weigh in on each other's publications and it gets very messy, but I would rather it were messy uh, and it was resisting on some level this horrible hierarchical violence, which you know, Kaya was talking about in which, you know, I've also experienced um, within these more kind of elite, elite literary spaces. Um, and it, it still goes on today. And I feel like it, it shouldn't. And, and it does. <laughs> yeah. I just um, in the chat, um, Shani, who I, uh, Kadwalanda, who, who I should say is a excellent um, poet, so I'm really happy that you're here, Shani, says that it's interesting that the word anthology comes from anthos and um, legine, so anthology is a collecting of flowers, some interesting associations there of nature and commons of a different sort, and that, that was the, the word um, collecting there made me think of um, Matt's talk and Griffith's use of, of cataloguing that, that we're putting together that dictionary of North Eastern dialects, and I wondered, Matt, whether there's any connection to be made between um, Fran's um, work um, around producing anthologies around these, you know, uh, potentially contentious phrases like like poverty and the way in which Griffiths um, was trying to navigate ideas of community through producing um, these catalogues. Is there, is, there, is there a connection or something to say about more about Griffiths's work? Um. In short, yes, I mean, he, he's someone who was quite heavily involved in making anthologies himself, including as part of his like dialect work. So something before before he got down to co-founding the dialect group, um, he was putting together anthologies of um, you know, material, you know, fiction and you know, a lot of poetry as well uh, in the dialect of County Durham. And this is primarily historical material, of course. And this is uh, as a by way of, uh, kind of putting to pulling together a kind of complete summary of everything that he could find that was of a, of a certain standard that had been written within that dialect 
for, for certain. And what he, what he then does is move out of that, you know, pulling out uh, vocabulary from those poems and other texts as a kind of basis for the dictionary work. Um, and that, um, So, that, yes, so I guess there's, there's a kind of direct cultural activism involved in um, bringing together the material like that and then something else that can go out of it. Um, while I'm speaking, I, I was um, also yeah, quite stimulated by this comment that um, Nikolai made early on in the comments about which um, compared um, I guess what Savona was saying about Palestinian displacement uh, to um, yeah, uh, W.H. Jordan's poem Refugee Blues, which of course is you know, documenting the kind of forms of discrimination and marginalization faced by uh, re refugees in you know, the United States um, at the time of the Third Reich. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that seems a, I guess, a, perhaps a, a way of addressing the other question that you mentioned earlier, Steve, about um, negotiating violence, because you know, both what um, Savona was um, presenting and Auden's poem both uh, address violence by kind of documenting it in a very kind of painstaking, uh, precise way, um, without necessarily offering any easy kind of resolutions or ways out from it either, which is as it should be done, of course, because you know, that's true to how the world is operating at the moment. Um, and uh, of course, that has that has a kind of connection to the use of dialects in nation language as well, because you know, some of the poets I've mentioned um, have used you know, nation language and dialect in you know, like long form documentary works. So we're talking about Brathwaite using you know, Barbadian and Jamaican nation language to document um, you know, atrocities connected with you know, the slave trade and colonialism, or um, indeed uh, you know, Griffiths using dialect to document the economic violence inflicted on people of the northeast by mine owners and uh, later on by you know, the government in the 80s and 90s. Um, but the, the other re another reason why this, this particular poem by Auden is especially good to bear in mind is I guess connects to what um, Jerome was saying about um, porous communities. This is a poem which is you know, primarily about kind of, you know, European, mo mostly Jewish, I think you know, you know, Jewishness is mentioned in the poem, uh, refugees, but it's um, presented using an African-American form of the blues, um, which kind of suggests a kind of um, sympathy to some extent between these two, in some ways quite different communities and a way that the kind of poetics from one community can be put to the service or can operate in sympathy with another community. Okay. Gosh, Matt, that's that's so interesting. The idea, you know, and that in a way that'd be a wonderful place to go to to talk about the potential of sympathy or um, connection or conversation between um, not yeah different communities, but also the different communities of poets you will work on, which I guess it, it, on a kind of formal level is part of the ethos of this event and, and only giving you five minutes was to try to stage some site kind of possible relationships or relations between your your work. But yeah, that that idea of of how poetry might be a meeting place for different um, communities is, is really interesting um, to me. Um, I, I would like um to, to give the opportunity for for people who are here with us to to ask a question if they if they have one um you can i've just, just said here you can either use the hand up function which is at the top of your screen or or type directly um into the into the chat and, and I, I natalie or i can can read out the the, the question um for you um I was wondering whether um, Nikolai, who made the very, uh, very co cogent uh, link with um, uh, the Auden poem, uh, would like to expand a bit or, you know, reply to Matt. Um, maybe not, but... Yeah, so what I intended to say when she um, mentioned about Palestine and uh, I had in my mind politi uh, came the idea of political issues expressed in a poem. And in um, Auden's poem, 
uh, the second part, it says, once we had a country and we thought it fair, look in the atlas and you will find it there. We cannot go there now, my dear, we cannot go there now. So basically through his, uh, through this poem, he wanted to say that the country is still there, so the outline of the country is still there, but uh, the country has changed. So due to the whatever had happened, I don't know much history about uh, the, how it disappeared, but uh, is the, I, I think the main idea is how a political issue, a political issue was uh, was felt by someone and was put into writing and that kept uh, for ages like newer generations and generations afterwards they could read this and they they could say oh okay let's see what's this about so we keep a track of past events through poetry and in um um uh, I, 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 there, there was something uh, even about uh, identity and we, uh, for example, I'm Romanian and in um, we have a, a romantic poet, Mihai Eminescu, who wrote a poem uh, and addressing basically was addressed to the politicians at that time and wasn't it wasn't allowed to be published at that time but uh the poem says that what uh, i would like you my sweet what i would like for you my sweet country what i would like you my sweet country and this is repeating uh, many times but then in every like in every Catherine is saying a uh, is addresses at an issue and yeah, it, it's an interesting way of, uh, yeah, I think this is the way how poets at that time, they became angry and was expressing their um, 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 dissatisfaction. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, <laughs> I think, Xinhong, were, were you, um, you had your, Hand, right? yes, yes, but at the same time, I don't want to uh, take time from from people who would like ask some questions. So. Okay. I think I think you can you can you can speak to your own. I think if, if right. people can raise their hand or, or okay. write in the chat. Right. It was this notion as I was hearing colleagues and uh, the, the, the way in which community, the community has become a trope, um, obviously from GAFAM. Uh, Facebook and the rest of it. I go to the supermarket here in Paris. It's a large supermarket. And not only am I told by the head speakers constantly that I should share the community through my car or this or that, but I, actually I can see an agora, a quote, inside the huge French version of the MS or the what have you, Sainsbury's, the size of my flat. And, and the, the way in which this trope of community is being used on and on and on again to, to make us, Natalie, how could one say in English, nous faire prendre des vessies pour des lanternes, to make us think that something is literally something else. The way in which this terminology is, is, is used in a really shameless manner uh, to make us think that the most, each time we mention, we hear this terminology, we can be sure that it's, it's going to be, um, completely absent from what is proposed or what is experienced. And so we're so uh, in an overdose of this lie, basically, that I wonder, almost Orwellian use of language, that I wonder how we can get out of it uh, by using some some way of uh, idiosyncratically break it. And simultaneously, we know that what is behind, we're talking about the commons, we're talking about all sorts of things is required, is a good thing. So there's a bit of a there's a bit of a, of a trap here. I was wondering if colleagues would feel the same and and if they had antidotes to this asthma crisis that I have when I go to Sainsbury's. <laughs> it's not it's not um, it's not disconnected from um, Jessica's question in the chat, Jerome, where she says um, 
that she's excited by the ideas of swarms, the idea of permeable communities and commons, places where they can come together to share resources that are not owned. Um, what's our role as poets in cultivating these spaces and joining swarms, which is it's a related question to yours about um, to what degree can 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 poets puncture, disrupt um, the, the sense of um, like a false community or an imposed community? Um, yeah, so I, I, if, if the other speakers could, could speak to either one of those questions, that would be that'd be wonderful. So just to pick up, just to pick up the metaphor still further, I think um, pollinating as many different kinds of flowers as possible is a really good antidote in the sense that um, there are certain orthodoxies within the kind of particular communities. And what I've found to be more generative is to participate in several communities at once and to go to um, events tied to different communities and to encourage other people to do it as well. So I guess when we as poets are in a position to, for example, program or curate something, there's a real agency we have then to bring these different constituencies into community with each other. Um, and that's, I think, an agency we don't necessarily exercise as often as we could. Um, for example, what, what, what might be interesting is to bring two poets together on the basis of a theme, but for those poets to be working in entirely different ways, looking at that theme, I think that really thrills and fascinates me. What are the, what are the possibilities in publication and in live events and in other ways of working? Um, which bring as many different kinds of poetry into relation as you know as as possible because there are so many so many ways of of approaching poetic making um and you know the wider culture venerates only a few of those but we as poets don't have to reinscribe those same erasures Um, I just want to comment and say that um, that question really reminds me of and what you just said, Kay, as well, of of what you originally were saying in your first, um, in your kind of intro was sitting in a corner of a room and there are a certain un set of understandings amongst the people in there. And I think of what's just come to mind is this idea of community, not community making poetic making through those understandings so potentially as well this image of pollinating understandings um those relationalities as a way of taking generating um the kinds of spaces and world that we want to see um yeah it's this just an image of of i think um Yes, warming, I suppose. I'm interested to know what others think about, I think, how do we then tactfully utilize that kind of swarming or that kind of movement? Um, how do we gather that momentum, I suppose, if that's relevant? I think that the, the cross-pollinization that uh, Kaya was talking about is one way of, of make of creating community rather than creating communities so um the, co because communities are exclusive by nature um make put you know going from from one to to the other cross pollinating is one way of making community and of uh, Glissant, Glissant talks about how nowadays he thinks that community is porous and rhizomatic. Um, and I think this is, um, uh, you know, a link with what Kaya was saying. Um, and I think one big problem that we were talking about France, Paris just, uh, just now 
um, in, in France, the idea of community is frowned upon by the establishment because, because um, the idea that uh, not everybody uh, is the same is, um, is rejected. So uh, my, my point is that um, the, the notion of community is used politically to um, to steer the country in directions that um, force them to erase uh, their identities or their what they see as their identities. Uh, I don't know what um, Jérôme thinks, uh, but um, it's it's a it's a rather wide uh, wide topic. Um, yeah. But there's a bit of a, as often with the French, there's a bit of a of a paradox. On the one hand, they they try to to put forward a, a universal system that is inclusive of everyone. On the other hand, the historical implementation of it happens to have taken place in a republic that was a colonial empire. So uh, it's a bit of a paradox, a violent one, and this um, this hidden truth has been denied uh, ever since and even today. Uh, finds it very difficult to come to the fore and be uh, and be phrased and be be explained. So hence the the, the problem, the crisis, with the French version of uh, universalism, be it in terms of laicity, secularism, or any other any other aspects. It's it's moving ever so slowly, uh, but the debate starts to be open. Do we have any questions? Oh. <laughs> Well, I had one, <laughs> which I was just typing out just to get it out, you know, to try, but try to um, hear myself clearly. Um, so I just, uh, you know, listening to the, the conversation, I was thinking about the way in which Glaçon's writing is so metaphor rich. As soon as you kind of dive into the book, he's, he's talking about roots and, and the abyss. And later on, I think it was a quote that Fran picked up on the, the wonderful quote about we the weave. Uh, and we've been talking about metaphors here, right? Cross pollinization, swarms, and it seems that metaphor is a form of relation. Um, it's, it's seeing one thing in, in, in terms of another. And I have to confess, in terms of my own poetics, I don't think about metaphor all that much as like a as, as like a, con, a building block of, of my own my own work. But I, I'm wondering to what extent do metaphors structure or generate community or do violence to it? In part because you know there's some really established metaphors for talking about the nation state, like the ship. Or there's, you know, we, we talk about, you know, fraternity or sororities. Like, so we use metaphors of the family to think about larger um, notions of community, and 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 because so so obviously these these terms, um, these ways we have of conceptualizing community, um, are, are incredibly powerful and deeply woven into um, the life of the nation and the way the nation thinks about itself. Um, and obviously, poetry is a place where we interrogate and use metaphors in in new ways. And I'm wondering whether whether that's important to any of your work or the poets you work on. I guess um, whether there's any power left in interrogating the metaphors we use within our own you know, in our own poetry. You mean you mean metaphor we, we would use in our own poetry to address communities to talk about communities yes i guess so yeah yeah yes <laughs> i mean i'm perhaps you know i uh, yeah i also i also mean just you know whether poetry is a place where we could test the metaphors we use to think about community that's what right. i mean right yeah. right I, I think it is the case. I think it is the case, at least in the, in the French poetry that I uh, that I'm uh, associated to and that I know best. I think it is the case. Um, it is it is testing both in terms of themes and motifs, but also in terms of forms through this question of language, the the, the tool of the community, and that in which it refracts itself. Uh, the agency of it is language. If you start shaking language, something is going to happen to the community uh, that is using this language. So in this sense, both at the level of, uh, of theme, address, but also at the level of form, um, yes, it is being it's being used quite a bit with sometimes the difficulty to become communitarist as poets. Uh, 
which then becomes another conundrum. Uh, if the idea is to address or to or to integrate the common or community, and then to end up um, to end up in a not not in sectarian sense, but to end up in a very tiny representation of yourself as a community of progressist, neo avant-gardist, or what have you, then it becomes a bit of a, a turning in circles. Uh, but I think the, the the best way in which it's done, from where I see it here in this country, is through um, through addressing language, the form. Um, and, and not in a formalist sense, disconnected from the politics that we've heard notably in Sarona's words, definitely addressing it, but always keeping together um, the horizon, the environment, the, the, the motif, the topic, and the modalities of the expression and the modalities of the, of the, of the poeticity. In the sense, yes, it's constantly being a Reorganized. I remember that with Natalie at, at the, the center, whose acronym I seem to have forgotten. Natalie, the, the acronym of the of, of your center on right. right, exactly. We've had many, uh, many, many discussions on, on, on French theory around this from um, from Blanchot to, uh, to Jean-Luc Nancy, and it's been quite important. So and, and this has had an echo in poetic practice per se, absolutely. Yeah, uh, kind of following up on that, I was, um, Steve's comments made me think um, not just about metaphor, but about how that might compare to the, the figure of the simile in this respect. Uh, so a metaphor intrinsically like, asserts, in a sense, the kind of identity of two things, even on a kind of rhetorical level. These two things are the same, whereas a simile um, Actually, it's a. Uh, it doesn't assert that the two things are identical. Like this, the two things are still there, but just in a state of comparison with one another. And uh, relating to you know, Glisson, I mean, he he talks about these uh, kind of primordial kind of epics of European civilization, um, things like the um, yeah, Homer's Iliad, uh, you know, the Odyssey, um, you know, Virgil's Aeneid, for example. And how these are epics in a sense of um, kind of displacement or wandering and a kind of search for like moving into this kind of communal identity. And I haven't really like thought through uh, what that would um, mean in terms of a poetics, but it does strike me that these epics are kind of noted for the repeated use of the Homeric, Homeric simile. Actually, you know, hence the um, yeah, maybe of that structure. So it, not so much, not so much for the metaphors that come into the poetry, but for a continual use of simile to describe the world that's being moved through there. So it could be that um, simile by its nature would offer a, I guess, a way of maintaining this kind of difference between communities while putting them into a kind of porous conversation with each other, as opposed to metaphor, which would Kind of combine them into one kind of conglomerated glob, as it were, of imagery. Perhaps. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Matt. That was really, you know, really useful. Thank you. Perhaps I should read out this um, comment in the in the chat, so it's so it's been been heard. Um, Guji says, "This isn't a question, but a comment." This conversation reminded me of this quote from Glissant about maroon communities given in the term marronage. The marrons, maroons, are the fugitive slaves, and marronage, originally the political act of these slaves who escaped into the forested hills of Martinique, now designates a form of cultural opposition to European American culture. This resistance takes its strength from a combination of geographical connectedness essential to survival in the jungle and absent in the descendants of slaves alienated from the land that could never be theirs. Memory retained in oral forms and voodoo ritual and all the canny detours, diversions and ruses required to deflect the repeated attempts to recuperate this cultural subversion. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. It's a nice, I think it's a very uh, thorough theoretical model for some of the stuff we're talking about. That's true. And he takes a lot of it from Deleuze and Gattari, hence the links with uh, what you were saying earlier. Mm. But I, I'm, I'm quite, 
into the end, and Ruse is regarded as effect the repeated attempts to recuperate this cultural subversion. I was just putting notes down. How can how could this community we're talking about, not, without being completely able to define it, be a vehicle for a practice of difference, all the while um, avoiding total fragmentation? That's what I was trying to say with this notion of idiosyncrasy and versus a relationship to common language between the uh, transitive and intransitive, nor nor melting into some weird marketing, be it political or or or, or or economic that we've been hearing, uh, the vehicle of some marketing for fragmenting the market, basically. How can we how can we go through this this trope of uh, the common or the commons um, practice of difference of idiosyncrasy, all the while being uh, brought back to a scale that can be make sense rather than being just an addition of pure singularities with no relationship. Um, so without total fragmentation and yet without being subsumed under a huge new either economic a globalized marketing discourse or a new doxa, if not a new church. That's a tall order, hence the interest of this theme. It bites, it doesn't work. We have to try harder like uh, Sam B says. You're muted. I was about to say thank you, um, Jerome. I mean, just just to say, um, not to respond to that wonderfully evocative comment, but just to say, I think we probably do need to end at some point soonish. So if you have got a question now, um, the time to ask it. Um, one of the things, perhaps, I, I want to discuss after this session going forward with Serona is, is I, I love that really powerful line in your poem, I want to feel the weight of your hatred on me. And I was just thinking in, in light of this conversation about metaphor, you know, I'm interested in that word weight and the idea of hatred being given a form, a mass yes. that weighs, that pins. Um, I'm wondering, you know, about that, about about what work that that line is doing. And it's a really interesting way of um, you know, going back to those, those questions I had about violence at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, wanting to to accept the violence onto oneself as a kind mm -hmm. of as a kind of weight on the body to feel it um, as, as, as almost a starting point to, to um, working out uh, the kind of shape and space of the world that we can, we can live in. Um, and it's, you know, it comes back to Jerome, you know, this idea of trying harder, making the body, making the poet work harder at all points for, for any possible community that could be articulated. But at the same time, I'm super interested in the, in the kind of the, almost the light play that's in Griff Griffiths's work of these, you know, invented. Um, well, they're not neologisms, are they, Matt? They're they they they're, they're kind of almost. Um, I can't remember the phrase you used. I mean, the, the the use of kind of northeastern dialect, inventing these new terms, which might be used in poems, but could perce perceivably be used outside of poems too. I like this idea of making like a, a linguistic resource of the poem being a resource for other people to use um, as a new way of thinking. Um, outside of some of the binds that, that Jerome was articulating. Yeah, and in, in a sense, this kind of uh, business of creating something new out of the kind of historical resources of the dialect or the language, um, I guess it could be understood as a form of um, marinage, if you're going to stretch the definition of it a little bit. Because uh, we, we are talking there about, um, yeah, a kind of community which is, um, as in some ways, needs to defend itself from a kind of hege hegemony. In this case, the kind of hegemony of like metropolitan standard English, perhaps, and uh, is able to, or could potentially be able to, because I'm not sure this potential has been fully realised as yet, even though it's something Griffiths is working towards. Uh, there's the potential there to, um, yeah, Look, look for purposes of, I guess, like cultural self-defense to this um, kind of historical resource and pull things out of there, but not not leave them kind of static as something which is from the past, which just needs to be conserved, but use that as something that can move forwards you know, towards the future. And in some senses, Griffiths is, um, I guess, tackling the same kind of 
dichotomy that Jerome was talking about with this. Uh, yeah, how, how do you remain open to other cultural influences while uh, staving off have this hegemonic to, you know, yeah, cultural totalitarianism? Um, and uh, Griffiths is it was certainly in his own work is someone who was very heavily involved in that. So you have uh, these kind of compound words which we were discussing. He explicitly compares these to the kind of kennings that you find in you know, Norse poetry and to extent in Old English poetry as well. Um, and you know, so putting together two different words to create something which is kind of like riddling allusion to the thing you want to describe. Um, but uh, you know, of course, he's also open to you know, bringing in ideas and you know, poetic imagery from, um, so for example, Caribbean culture. There's a lot of um, yeah, references to Rastafarianism and Bob Marley that start coming into his work in the 90s, and plenty of allusions to you know, Haitian voodoo in the um, 1980s as well, as a kind of uh, revolutionary phenomenon uh, that, in some way, in some respects, could help help to inform political active activism in this country is you know, something that um, I guess like working say work for example working class or you know, other marginalized groups in the UK could um, learn from on an international basis in order to then use that knowledge to stave off the hegemony thank you Matt I, I do I do feel there's so much more to discuss and say. Um, I mean, uh, one thing that, that that Kayo didn't mention, but it was in his bio, is you know the importance of kind of sampling to 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 his work and his thinking about poetry and 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 its practice. And in some ways, Matt, yeah. you know, it sounds like Griffiths was kind of sampling um, in a way or thinking about. Um, mm sampling different languages and putting them together into new combinations. Um, Kaya, you don't necessarily need to say anything, but I'm wondering whether whether you'd like to say anything about about your you, the way in which sampling might be an important way of thinking about community anew in, in, in your practice. Um, I've been thinking especially about how um, sampling is a way of bringing one's work into kinship with past voices lost voices um and also i guess uh, as a sample based musician part of what you're doing is digging really deep into the archive in order to find and uncover what has been passed over in some sense so i guess it's the reinscription of what has passed in some some important way um but it's also a form of collaborative authorship as well. Um, and that makes me think about um, how Matt, your project looks at a kind of multilingualism, um, the kind of continuance of a hybrid mode, I think is a very powerful thing in sample based communities. And I think that's what the poets I'm working on have really taken from sampling is that possibility of bringing all manner of disparate elements and stimuli into one space. Um, in particular, there's a poet called Douglas Kearney, who I'm thinking about um, at the moment, who likens his poetic process to using a sampling drum machine and um, manipulating the words in his poetic performance in the same way that you might if you had um, pieces of recorded music that you had frag fragmented into a new um composition so yeah i think there's an important kind of through line um between that kind of ideas of multilingualism and also the ways that nation language function to augment our understandings of not just english but englishes um so yeah i think sampling is a way of complicating our kind of auditory perception in some way um presenting us with a kind of past present and future at the same time which i think as a performer particularly you can really tap into um playing with time in those ways <laughs> 
Thanks, Kayo. Um, I've just been quite pleased that people are connecting in the chat, sharing email addresses. One of the things that uh, Natalie and I um, spoke about wanting to do is after this um, event is possibly arranging a, a you know a more e extended uh, sharing session um, in in the autumn term. We've been thinking about this question of, of translation, Jerome, and the way that the possibility of kind of pairing poets, but doing translation live in the room to, tr you know, so I'd be curious, you know, to have your thoughts, you know, at, at some point about about this, the, the problems of kind of the, the global Englishness and how that might be confronted or negotiated um, in the event, especially given what Kaya was saying about the um, importance of thinking about the politics of community when we come to program and organize um, events such as these. Um, so there will be um, more opportunities, I hope, to, to discuss some of these themes and ideas that have, have come up um, during this session. Um, I noticed that Ryan Ormond, um, another really interesting poet um, in the chats, there's also poems that respond directly and explicitly to poems by others within the commons. Um, the branching out this can achieve. I guess I, love, I like that idea of, of, of naming um, within poetry and using the poem to, to forge community. And that's actually something that Bill, Griffith, Bill Griffiths and a lot of the poets and the British Poetry Revival did was dedicate poems to one another. It can be a way of um, forging community. Of course, someone like, like Frank O'Hara was always kind of using names within his poetry to, to create kind of um, uh, coteries um, and, 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 and networks of, of, of artists. Um, Natalie, I wonder, do you want to say anything um, uh, to round yeah, us I was off? Just, um, saying, uh, I just wanted to say actually that I think it would be wonderful uh, to have um, a second, uh, maybe as you say in the autumn, where we actually hear your, your poetry and then we can we can then discuss because I think I, I feel like from what you were saying about your poetry, um, there are lots of links with what Jérôme does, for instance, and um, uh, the I, when when his uh, when Jérôme's poems are translated, I'm I'm really excited to introduce introduce them to you because I think that you know, they will resonate, they will, you know, that they will be significant to you and vice versa. Um, I think this exchange would be fantastic. So if you're all willing, uh, we can think about um, part two. Uh, events. It'd be a pleasure, it'd be a pleasure. That's, uh, yeah, that's, but yes, thank you very much. It was, it was perfect it was really really stimulating very interesting and uh, um, I'm looking forward to meeting you again soon same yes. here same here thank you very much to all of you well, I'm going to give a, um, a the, the, the the official thank you to to all our speakers uh, Matt Martin uh, uh, Kayo Chingoni Sirona Abuka Fran Locke and Jerome Gam it has been wonderful to to have you with us thank you for your your presentations and the really exciting and um, fulfilling conversation we had and um, the challenge <laughs> the challenge goes on and thank you to our audience and for your questions and comments in the chat um, I did just say, share my email on the chat if you wanted to to be added to the mailing list um, we, well, you'll find out about future events there or by uh, ch checking out our kind of um, listings which which Matt keeps updated um, for us so thank you so much everyone thank you Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks for a great evening. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.